we're going to be going over today uh, to the book of Romans chapter 10 again. <clears throat> and we're looking at, this morning as you can see up by the slide, Israel is set aside, not cast away. We're building into Romans chapter uh, 11 verse 1. Has God cast away his people? God forbid. And, of course, answering that question, I understand why that is true, but uh, God has not cast away the nation of Israel, but he has set it aside. And set it aside the nation until the kingdom age. Then he's going to come back and restore the kingdom age. In the kingdom age, restore the nation of Israel. And it is from that restoration, Christ's restoration of the, of the nation of Israel, that he will establish his kingdom. And it's going to be a one world empire where Israel will be the one world empire. Christ will be governing from Jerusalem. So we'll have a word of prayer and then we'll read this text. Again, Father, as we bow before you today, we are thankful that. Lord, we just rejoice in all these wonderful hymns that we have sung. And we're reminded of our wonderful Savior and of your grace uh, in sending him to this world. And Lord, the ramifications of all of that are overwhelming to our uh, finite little minds of what you have done and what you are doing, what you will do in the days to come. Lord, I, I believe we are standing upon the uh, paradigm shift of, of this history of the world and the rapture of the church, the tribulation time, and the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. And we pray that each of us would be mindful of these things, and especially this time of the year as we think of loved ones who are not saved. And Lord, we pray today that you'd help each of us to understand the great promises that are ours and are part of our inheritance in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, we, we read these last few verses and end of chapter 11. Remember, in the Bible, the chapter divisions and the verse divisions are not inspired of God. They've been added to help us. And quite late in history, they were added. But uh, as we look at these, we want to keep the context that goes through from chapter 10 and goes into chapter 11. So as you read, they just kind of take away the chapter divisions. You take them out of your sight for just a moment and move into the transition of what God is saying because it's a very smooth transition from chapter 10 into chapter 11. As it is from chapter 11 into chapter 12 and on, on, on. there's very smooth transitions of moving from, from various teachings and, and explanations of these things that are important to us. So it says here, but Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. That's uh, uh, Isaiah. But to Israel, you saith, all day long, God is saying this, all day long through the prophet, have I stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. Now you stop off there and you come into Romans 11, 1. Get the transition? I say that. Now God has what? All day long he has stretched forth his hands unto this disobedient and gainsaying people of the nation of Israel. All day long, constantly, the point is. God has been consistent in his efforts to turn the heart of the children of Israel. The long-suffering patience with God. So I say then, hath God cast away his people? Has God given up on Israel? No. And that's a whole intent here. God forbid. That's an unthinkable thing because God has made a promise. And then he says, for I also am an Israelite. Otherwise, he's an example that uh, God is still working on the Jews. He's the seed of Abraham, the tribe of Benjamin. He was a born-again Jew. We must remember that the early church 
Uh, in the first few weeks, at least up until Pentecost, the vast majority of them were Jews that got saved. Now, as we look at all of these and we come in, we have to understand that the long-suffering God is certainly exemplified in his dealings with the nation of Israel since their redemption as a nation from Egyptian bondage. Now, this is God's long-suffering with lost people. Look back on your life. Would you say God is long-suffering with you? I'm amazed that God would have that thing to do with me at all. Let alone to let me preach and lead people. I mean, that's just an amazing, long-suffering grace of God. But the long-suffering of God here is dealing with the nation of Israel since the redemption as a nation from Egyptian bondage. They actually weren't even consummated as a nation, even though in the plan of God they were promised, they were consummated as a nation at Sinai when they were given the Mosaic Covenant. So at the time of the calling of Abraham, God has bound himself to the nation of Israel in all his many covenant promises to Abraham. And he won't break that bond. He has bound himself to it. God has been faithful to those promises even when Israel was predominantly unfaithful to him. And God's faithfulness is dependent upon his character, not on the faithfulness of those he wants to bless. Not going to happen. Otherwise, did Israel deserve God's faithfulness? No. Someone asked me to tell them why I deserved God's love. And the answer is very quick, simple. God does not love me because I'm lovely. God loves me because he's loved. God keeps his promises. And that's a wonderful thing to which we can anchor our eternality in our souls to. Now, God's suffering has been the instrument through which he has maintained a faithful remnant in the nation of Israel throughout the church age. Has all of the Jews completely abandoned faith in Christ and Messiah? Well, this is to what Paul is referring in Romans 11, 4 through 5, in God's response to Elijah, who claimed that he stood alone for God. Now here we have all of these Jews there surrounding this altar of Baal. And Elijah says to him, choose you this day whom you will serve. If Baal be God, let serve him. If Jehovah be God, serve him. Now should a prophet have ever had to do that? Now we can't really imagine the crowds that came there that day to that test. All the prophets of Baal are there. Of course, they would all end up emptying their blood out on the ground as they were killed. But here it says, But what saith the answer of God unto him? To Elijah. I reserve to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even, to the, even so then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Otherwise, there are, there are Jews today that are, are the elect Jews who are saved. They're of the faith seed of Abraham, not of the flesh seed of Abraham. Now he's going to go on and explain that considerably in the next verses in Romans chapter 11. But every new generation has the grace of God and the long-suffering of God to create another faithful generation to carry on. No excuses. Now, there is a free will involved in this, and our children and our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, don't necessarily have to follow everything we teach or even by our example. And there will be some that do not. I have grandchildren that do not follow the Lord. But we still have a hope for them. And God is long-suffering in their life. And we can see God working in there. A couple of those kids, I believe, are coming now to God's uh, opening their heart to the things of God. And we praise God for that. Now that that's I think we have fifteen grandchildren, and I can't I've lost count of how many great grandchildren we have. We've got two new ones 
great-grandchildren this last month. So I've lost count. Patty can't count that high anyway, so. <laughs> she gets her calculator out and she has to figure out that is. So the critical point here is essential to understanding the doctrine of election and the teaching of Jesus to Jews in the gospel regarding the kingdom age. The whole nation of Israel was elect, but they were not all saved. The priesthood of Israel was elect, but they weren't all saved. In fact, the majority of them were cast away and become apostate, but they were still elect. National Israel, the flesh descendants of Abraham, was set aside. Now, the key verse you have for that is Hosea 2.11. And it says that the Mosaic Covenant, Sabbath days and holy days, were all put on Shabbat. What does that mean? They're put to rest. They're set aside. And so, not cast away throughout the church age while Christ builds his church to be a new ruling priesthood of Israel after the order of Melchizedek. A new priestly order. Not Levitical anymore. Hebrews chapter 5 and Hebrews chapter 7. So, however, the critical transition regarding the God's election of grace, now get this, is only the faith seed of Abraham, the born again by grace through faith, descendants of Abraham, will be those regathered to fulfill the Palestinian covenant. Jews that reject Jesus Christ during the tribulation are not going to go into the kingdom age, and they're not going to be the restored nation of Israel. Only saved Jews. And they're going to have, of course, 144,000, 12,000 of each tribe sealed in heaven with the name Jehovah Tiskadu, or Jehovah Righteousness, testimony to salvation, the justification of faith, who return to the earth the last half of the trip and will witness to the nation of Jews all over the world. And the vast majority of the Jews will come to Christ. Will they all? I don't know. I doubt it, because it's still a free will choice. So, however, the critical transition here, then, is this. Uh, God is going to gather these to fulfill this Palestinian covenant. Now, that regathering doesn't take place until the second coming. Not now. 1948 and the Balfour Act in 1947 is not the regathering of the nation of Israel. There are more Jews all around the world than there are now today in the nation of Israel. There are more actually Palestinians in the uh, nation of Israel than there are Jews. But the point here is no lost Jew or any unbeliever will even see the kingdom of God. John 3.3 3. Now, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, we'll differentiate those two here a little bit. But give it to you very simply. The kingdom of heaven, or the heavens, is the creation. Christ will rule over his creation. That's the kingdom on earth. The kingdom of heaven is the eternal state. That's the kingdom of God. I'm sorry, the kingdom of God is the eternal state. And uh, that's the kingdom of God. Now, without this context... What Jesus teaches Nicodemus in John chapter 3 cannot be fully understood. He's talking to Jesus about the kingdom of God. And John chapter 3 is primarily instruction regarding the fulfillment of the Palestinian covenant. That is what Jesus, Nicodemus is coming to ask Jesus about. When is this Palestinian covenant going to be fulfilled? What's it, what's it going to be like? Now, rather than getting into that discussion with Nicodemus, what does Jesus say? He said, unless you're born again, you won't even see it. So read John chapter 3 with the Palestinian covenant in mind, teaching Jews that they must be born again to enter the kingdom of God, eternity, and see the way the text expands itself then in our understanding of God's prophetic promises to Israel. Now, is it only to Jews or does everybody have to be born again? 
Well, that's everybody. The fulfillment of the Palestinian covenant runs continuously, consistently, consistently through every statement of Jesus to Nicodemus through the whole chapter. And it is really the heart and soul of its meaning. In John chapter 3, Jesus manifests God's long-suffering, now here it is, as he seeks to transition Dr. Nicodemus into the faithful remnant of Israel, the faith seed of Israel, not just the flesh seed. Long-suffering of God. Patiently dealing with him as a nation and now individually. Now look here in verse 1. John chapter 3. We'll read this whole chapter. And remember we're looking at it from the text, context of a Jewish man talking to someone he thinks might be the Messiah but he's a little bit afraid of identifying with Jesus because he's a Pharisee and a member of the Sanhedrin. He is the go-to guy in Israel for if somebody wants an answer to a theological question John uh, Nicodemus would be the guy that they would go to to get it. But he's a little afraid that he's going to lose his prominence and his position uh, if he's identified with Jesus. And, he's, and, he, and, and verse 1 tells us that. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, a Sanhedrin. The same came to Jesus, how? By night. I want you to get a little picture in your mind of the little narrow streets of Jerusalem. Houses on both sides of the street, just enough room for a cart to get through, pretty much all there was. Cobblestones uh, on the road. And here come Nicodemus sneaking along in the shadows alongside the buildings. He doesn't want to be seen because he's a well-known guy. And he's sneaking along there and and he, and he wants to do, he's, he comes to Jesus by night. And he said unto him, Rabbi, what's that mean? We know that you are a very learned person. He is essentially equating Jesus, Rabbi, as one of the most learned of Israel. Had Jesus had this kind of training as a young man? No, he was a carpenter. <laughs> but he was God. And he said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. That's all he recognized him as. <laughs> Verse 3 is a pretty radical statement. Jesus answered and said unto him, oh, yeah. Well, thank you very much, Nicodemus. That's very kind of you to say. I'm glad that you recognize that I am a learned scholar of, of uh the Jewish people, and uh, sit down, let's have a cup of tea together, and we'll talk the theology, right? Is that what he says? He says, no, no, no. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, um, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Otherwise, Nicodemus, a mere genetic connection to Abraham, will not get anyone, get anyone into the kingdom. Not going to happen. You have to be born again. Did Nicodemus understand it? No. Verse 4 tells us that. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and, and be born? Well, praise God, he cannot. <laughs> that is not a, that's not even something I want to think about. But Obviously, he's being facetious, right? He's not a, that's not an honest inquiry. He's being obnoxious and facetious. Jesus answered, verily, verily. Again, verily, verily, is this is undebatable. I'm not debating this with you. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water... That's a physical birth as a physical flesh descendant of Abraham. When my wife had our, our last, our, our, our daughter Debbie, I believe it was. No, Dina, wasn't it? 
Dina, her water broke with Dina, right? Was that Dina that or Debbie? I can't remember. One of those two. Anyway, they were born. Things, things had to come pretty quickly after that. That's a water birth. So, it's a physical birth. A physical flesh descendant of Abraham. Yes, you have that. Uh, except a man be born of the, of the water and of the spirit. That's a spiritual birth. A spiritual faith seed descendant of Abraham. In order for you to get into the kingdom of God, you have to have two births. One physical, one spiritual. Two birthdays. I've got two birthdays. I don't know exactly what my second birthday was, but I know I had one. So he goes on and he says here, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That's eternity. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That's the water birth. What is that? That's temporal. The water birth is temporal. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. A spirit birth is eternal. That's how you get into the kingdom of God, the eternal state. You have to be born again. And then he says in verse 7, Marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. This isn't, shouldn't be too hard for you to comprehend. Then he says, now he goes on and he explains that it's spiritual. He says he's using the wind as a um, uh, metaphor, if you will, to explain what it is a spiritual. He says, the wind bloweth where it lifteth, and thou hearest the sound thereof. Well, you can hear the wind, but thou canst not tell it whence it cometh. You can't see it. Whether it goeth, you can't see it. So it's everyone that is born of the Spirit. This isn't a visible thing. It's spiritual. Now verse 9, Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? See, this is what happens when you spend all of your, most of your waking hours running around with a bunch of liberals that don't even believe in spiritual things. That's what happened in Nicodemus. He, most of the Sanhedrin were Sadducees. They didn't believe in spiritual things. They didn't believe in eternal life. They believed in the life that we have right now. When you die, you die. Didn't believe in the resurrection. Didn't believe in the eternal state. That's, you know, that's where Nicodemus, he'd run around these guys. And Jesus answered it and said unto him, look at this, Art thou a master, a master teacher of Israel, and knowest not these things? What does that say? Nicodemus was expected to know this. He should have known it. Now why is it that people don't know this? Well, I'll tell you why. Most of it was because their thinking and their discussion and the preaching was all captured by liberals. So the vast majority of preaching and teaching that they heard was teaching by liberals. But unfortunately, it's not even taught by those who should know better. They just were silent about it. Verily, verily, he says in verse 11, I say unto thee, we speak that what we do know and testify that which we have seen and ye receive not our witness. Jesus is talking about empiricism. He came from heaven. He lived in eternally in the presence of his father, the triunity of God. He says, this is not an issue of faith for me. I have seen it. I have lived it. I, I know what is real. And he says, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen and you receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? If I talk to you about physical things and you don't believe those, now even the miracles that I've done, how, how can I talk to you about heavenly spiritual things? You can't comprehend them. What is he talking about? The natural man receiveth not the things of God. Because they are what? Spiritually discerned. Verse 13. 
and no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven. And the Son of Man which is in heaven. Now, this is still before the crucifixion and ascension of praise. So no one, no man had ever gone into heaven. They'd gone into Abraham's bosom. And they were waiting for their day when Christ would lead captivity captive and to be absent from the body to be present with the Lord. But that hadn't happened yet. And verse 14, as most lifted up as most or like as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man must be lifted up. Can you imagine what Nicodemus must have been thinking as he saw Jesus hanging on the cross? Because he was there. Most of the apostles other than John weren't there, but Nicodemus was there, along with Joseph of Arimathea. They were there. I, I imagine this verse of scripture says, oh, okay. Now I know. I understand. I remember Nicodemus, it is believed he was a half-brother of the Jewish historian Josephus. And Nicodemus, if he is that same man, became a born-again Christian, died in obscurity and poverty because he lost his position in the Sanhedrin. And he gave it all to Jesus. And verse 15 now comes alive, that whosoever, including Nicodemus, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He's talking about the kingdom of God. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Remember, he's talking to the guy who came sneaking around in the shadows to Jesus by night, which was a manifestation of the fact that he did not believe who Jesus was yet. I believe he does later, but not yet. Verse 19, and he here's a confirmation of it. And this is the condemnation. What? That light. God's revelation of spiritual and right doctrine. That light is coming to the world. That's the incarnation of Jesus. And men love darkness. Oh, Nicodemus sneaking around in the shadows, coming to Jesus by night. You're one of them. Lies and false doctrine spoken to Nicodemus who came to Jesus by night, verse 2. You love darkness rather than the light. Because your deeds were evil. Now if he's part of the Sanhedrin, they had one of two things. They either could believe Jesus was the Messiah, or they wanted to get the goods on him to have him crucified. Nicodemus is facilitating right in the back of that. He's vacillating, I'm sorry. He, he's, he's not quite sure. He's, he's vacillating between the two. Not quite sure yet. For verse 20. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be evil. Now think of what that's saying to Nicodemus. You think God knew exactly what he was talking about here? Jesus was talking about when he was talking to Nicodemus. Can you imagine the cutting conviction that fell upon his heart? I believe the reason why in John 12 that many of the Pharisees believed on him but would not confess it because of fear of the Jews was because Nicodemus was in there. And he's asking questions. And he's raising issues. And he defends Jesus on a couple of occasions. Not sure yet. 
But I'm sure that he was sure when he saw Jesus on the cross and he remembers these words, the Son of Man be lifted up. He says, For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. What's that mean? Discovered as false, and, and he be admonished by that, by those deeds. What's he talking about? You're sneaking around in the dark. But he that doeth the truth cometh to the light, that he, his deeds may be manifest that they're wrought in God. Otherwise, honesty, Nicodemus. Honesty. I've been honest with you. You be honest with me. <laughs> Do you think God doesn't know all about you already? What part of you doesn't God know about? What thought doesn't he know? What emotion is he not familiar with? Now, although it's not necessary to exposit the details of every teaching of Jesus regarding the fulfillment of the Palestinian covenant and his kingdom teachings in the Gospels, it is necessary to look at a few who see the doctrinal continuity of his kingdom teaching. And when Jesus uses the phrase kingdom of heaven, he's referring to his creation under the kingdom of God where God dwells. There's a chain of command in even in this. The kingdom of heaven is under the kingdom of God. The sovereignty of God uh, in the eternal state reigns over the kingdom uh, on earth. And the kingdom of God is eternal. The kingdom of heaven will last 1,000 years under the restoration of human dominion over the creation restored by the God-man, King Jesus, at his second coming. And it will last 1,000 years. Yet there is a distinction between Israel and the church in the kingdom age, teaching of Jesus. And that is the distinction often of Jesus Christ in the, in the uh, gospel. Look at Matthew 22, verse 1. We've got to hurry along. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, the kingdom of heaven, the, the kingdom of dominion, sovereignty of the first creation, when you say the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of the heavens, is likened to a certain king which made a marriage for his son. Now what is this marriage? This is the marriage of the bridegroom with the bride, the church. So this is what we know, all the marriage suffered the land. And he sent forth his servants, that's old covenant prophets, to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again, he sent forth other servants, that's the new covenant believers, church age believers, saying, tell them, tell the Jews which are bidden, behold, I've prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready, come unto the marriage. What is it? That's just a whosoever. Right? Anybody, come. You can come. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise, and the remnant, the Jewish unbelievers, took his servants, the new, new covenant believers, including and especially the martyrs for Christ of the seven-year tribulation, and entreated them spitefully and slew them. This is the sixth detail of the Palestinian covenant and the judgment of the nations and the, and the judgment of Israel's oppressors. Verse 7. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. That's the father. And he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murders and burned up their city. That's the judgment of the nations in the tribulation time. The last three and a half years predominantly. Then saith he to his servants, the wedding is ready. But they which were bidden were not worthy. That's national Israel. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, whosoever, bid to the marriage. And during the tribulation, there will be those saved from all nations and numbers of the sands of the sea. But God's going to send 144,000 evangelists to this world to preach that gospel of the kingdom. 
Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as you shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all, as many as they found, both bad and good. I'm one of the bad ones that God called. <laughs> Trying to make me good. That's, that's long-suffering God. And the wedding was furnished with guests, all church-age believers, including martyr tribulation saints. That's going to be the marriage supper. And when the king came, that's the second coming, into the, to, to see the guest, he saw there a man which had not a wedding garment. Now, wedding garments were provided simply for asking. That's the robes of righteousness that are given to us in justification. That, that, that is the, our gift of justification. And so what is this? He, he, there's a guy that came, wasn't justified. He wasn't justified by faith, but he came to the wedding. And he saith unto him, friend, how camest thou in here and in, in hither not having a wedding garment? What, what, you must be born again. That's how you get that. And he was speechless. What does that mean? He was muzzled. He had nothing which to vindicate himself. Because the only solution to that problem is you must be born again. And you were immediately issued a wedding garment. Your wedding garment's already reserved for you. And what is that? That's a glorification of your new body. And then the king said, uh, then said the king to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer, da outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the judgment of God at the second coming of Jesus. This is when the sheep are separated from the goats and the tares from the wheat. He says, for many are called, whosoever invitation to salvation, but few are chosen. That's vocational position to believe in priests in the kingdom of Christ. Now this last statement, for many are called, but few are chosen, is used in connection with two parables regarding national Israel. The first in Matthew 20, verse 16, is a parable of the vineyard regarding the complaint of the worker, Israel, during the Mosaic Covenant, who had worked all day long for the same wages, paid to the worker, had only worked for an hour, a Gentile believer during the church age, and they're getting the same reward, the same monetary remuneration. Otherwise, they, one worked all day long, got a penny, and one came and worked for an hour, got a penny, a day's wages. In this verse, it's connected with another statement that cannot be understood apart from a complementary hermeneutic that sets the context for its use elsewhere. And that is in verse 15 of Matthew 20. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Isn't it? Isn't, isn't the sovereign, sovereign to be able to choose whatever he wants to do? Does he have to give to someone because they've deserved it? Look, I'd be afraid to go before God and say, God, give me what I deserve. You can be sure that's never going to happen. But that's what these guys are saying. He says, is thine eye evil because I am good? So the, the last, that's church age believers, shall be first, and the first, Jewish believers, are going to be last in the kingdom. For many be called, but few chosen. That's a priesthood of the believer, vocationally. The first called, elected, was a national Israel. They, they should be last in the position at the second coming of Christ. The last called, the new priesthood of Israel, is the church, made up of new covenant saved Gentiles and Jews, they shall be first in position in the kingdom as they will rule and reign with Christ in glorified bodies. Now compared to the millions called over the millennia, only a small minority will hold this special vocational calling of Melchizedekian priest in the millennial kingdom. Now one more point I want to raise here before we have to get done here. The word be, Matthew 20 verse 16 is actually in the present tense. Now, so therefore, it would be appropriate to translate this as 
many are, are being called. It is used in the context of a warning to the Hellenized hierarchy of Judaism, mostly who were Sadducees at the time of Christ, regarding their replacement as the rulers and judges of Israel uh, and, the, and the world. They are not going to hold that position. That's why they wanted to kill Jesus, because they were afraid they were going to lose it. But Jesus said, there are many are being called who are going to replace you. Their replacement would be all believers who accept Christ as Lord. And this is being fulfilled in the church age, the dispensation of grace, and will be implemented in the millennial kingdom, the kingdom age, and those being called will be the new ruling priesthood of Israel under their prophet, high priest, king, Jesus, the Christ, Revelation 2, 26 through 28. We looked at that last week. The second use in connection with the long discourse with the chief priests and elders of Israel in the temple at Jerusalem, it is a summary statement of three parables beginning in Matthew 21, 23, going through Matthew 22, verse 14. Now, do not allow this statement to be taken out of the context of this discourse to impose, then, the suppositions of Calvinism upon it. Many are called, but few are chosen. When the statement, many are called, but few are chosen, is take, taken out of its dispensational context, the meaning of the statement is then greatly distorted. It's vocationally, they're called and chosen. Many are called, but only few are going to become those chosen priests of God in the kingdom age. These texts refer to the marriage supper of the Lamb, which takes place in heaven and during the tribulation. And ends at the return of Christ to the earth with his saints. Now, it might happen the first thing that takes place in the kingdom age. I don't know. That's when, when the judgment seat of Christ actually takes place. There's a lot of questions about it. I have a tendency to favor it right at the beginning of the, uh, in heaven, right at the beginning of the tribulation. But then we have to deal with the martyred tribulation saints who die for Christ. And they're going to be added and be part of the church as well. So what do we have, a second marriage of the Lamb? So there's, there's some questions there that have to be resolved. And I, don't, I, don't, I can't fully say that I can be confident when that's going to take place. But I do know this, it's going to take place. So this, which takes place in heaven, and uh, now resurrected, translated, glorified, the rule and reign of Christ as kings and priests during the kingdom age. The gift of salvation goes so far beyond a fire escape from hell that I don't even know where to begin. But what we have in Christ, friends, is something we ought to be able to rejoice in every single day. Amen. We reflect upon, think upon these things, and, and quite frankly, um, Sometimes you just want to stand up in a restaurant and say, let me tell you about my Jesus. Let me tell you what he's done for me. And let me tell you what he can do for you. And as they're dragging you out the door, you keep <laughs> preaching. <laughs> Friend, are you born again? Are you saved? Remember, imitation is to whosoever will. But response is required. It's an RSVP. You must be born again. But you have to do what Jesus said. Repent of your sins and your dead work. Stop trusting in all of that nonsense. And just come to Jesus. Understand that he has radically and once for all and forever satisfied God's wrath upon your sin and remitted the penalty of that sin and wants to give you his justification his righteousness and his indwelling spirit. He wants to do that. If you will confess him to be Lord, call upon his name to save you and to receive him in the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ. Simple. If you understand it, you can do it all in three seconds. Be born again. It's just, it's so simple. And he wants it to be simple. Be born again today. Receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Christian, if you're here today, the wonders that God has given you, start talking about it. 
Tell someone about it. That's really the translation of the Great Commission. Go ye into all the world and talk about Jesus. Preach the gospel. Father, as we close, and thank you so much for what you've done, what you are doing, what you will do. Our hearts are overwhelmed with it all, Father. It's difficult for our small little brains to comprehend it. But Lord, we grasp upon it and, and uh, thank you so much for who you are and what you've done, for your love for us and your long-suffering for us. In Jesus' name, amen.